Hello, everyone, and welcome to Thursdays Live with Chuk. Each week, we cover pressing topics that matter to you and your business. I'm Ariana Gonzalez from Chuk Attorneys and CPAs, tuning in from our San Diego office, and joining me today are partner and attorney Dia Matthews from our Edison, New Jersey office, and immigration specialist Giliana Saranova, also from our Edison, New Jersey office. Hi there, Dia and Giliana, and welcome. Thanks, Ariana. Good to be here. For today's topic, we'll be discussing the EB-1C visa and how managers and executives can navigate residency in the United States. Just a quick disclaimer before we begin, we are live on YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook. This conversation is for informational purposes only, and it does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have questions, please email us at info at chook.com so we can help you out. Now let's get into it, Giliana. Can you talk about the key eligibility criteria required for an EB-1C visa applicant? Sure. I think EB-1C visa is one of the most desirable visa as it has a priority uh, in the bulletin, right? In the line for a green card. So to qualify for EB-1C category, the applicant uh, must have been employed outside of the United States for at least one year in the three years preceding the petition or most recent um, non-immigrant admission if the applicant is already working for US petitioning employer. It's important that he should have worked at least one year in a managerial or executive capacity for a qualifying entity abroad, meaning that his employment must have been with the same employer an affiliate or subsidiary of the employer. So what defines a manager? Um, there are key uh, four um, elements of a manager, right? It's a person who manages a corporation, department, subdivision or function. He supervises and controls the work of other professional or managerial employees. He has authority to make personal decisions as to hiring and termination. And finally, he exercises discretion over day-to-day -day operations of the activity or function for which he has an authority. So that's the main requirements as far as eligibility for EB1C. Sounds like there's quite a bit of criteria that, that really went into detail. Thank you for that answer, Giliana. That's really great information. Dia, can you touch on the role of the petitioning employer in the EB-1C visa process? Sure, Ariana. Um, so the EB-1C petition cannot be filed without the support of the employer. Um, so in other words, you need a job offer in order to be able to file the EB-1C petition. And the petition is actually... Um, owned by the employer, not by the beneficiary. What is the role of the petitioning employer? The petitioner has to obviously demonstrate that the position, that the offered position is uh, available and um, really exists um, and is managerial uh, or executive as the case might be. Um, second, uh, the petitioner also has to establish ability to pay the offered wage. So the, in the petition, you have to list the wage that is being offered, the salary that is being offered for the position. And uh, the employer has to make supply sufficient financial documents to show that it can, um, it, uh, it can afford to pay the uh, beneficiary the offered wage. That's really important information for the employers who are hiring somebody with this visa. Giliana, how does the EB-1C visa differ from other employment-based visas, such as the L-1A? I know we have quite a few options when it comes to employment visas. So what's so special about the EB-1C? So EB-1C and L-1A, they both enable foreign companies to transfer their employees to United States office. And they have similar requirements as to uh, um, as far as managerial experience, but they have some significant differences that I'm going to mention. So first of all, uh, EB1C is an immigrant petition as um, compared to uh, L1A, which is a non-immigrant uh, work visa. The L1A visa gives an employee a temporary work authorization, and EB1C gets an employee in line to file uh, for a US green card, to file for adjustment of status. So although L1A status allows you to transfer to a new office, EB1 status requires your office to have been doing 
business for at least one year prior to your application. So that's a um, major difference. Um, another difference is that um, since EB1C status allows you to remain in U.S. permanently, uh, while L1A does not allow you to remain more than seven years, you can expect that USCIS will scrutinize um, EB1C application more thoroughly than L1A. And also having an approved L1A application does not guarantee that your EB1C application will be approved. And a follow up to, um, you know, what Giliana mentioned, um, it, you know, just uh, to re reiterate, right, that most people assume that just because you have an L1A that automatically qualifies you for the uh, EB1C3 category. But, um, you know, you could get an L1A after having been here um, on an in, in L1B status. And so if you are one of those that converted from L1B to L1A, then, uh, you know, the case for making an EB1C3 uh, petition uh, would be a little harder. Um, you have to, you know, really show that the person had sufficient managerial or executive uh, experience overseas with the same organization. Um, so that's, you know, that's uh, going to be scrutinized very carefully by CIS when you file an EB1 petition in those circumstances. Back to you, Arya. Thank you, Dia. Those are great things to keep in mind. So as you're talking about the importance of filing this, this application process correctly, because this is a, a permanent visa, um, oftentimes companies try to file the, the application for these visas on their own. What are some common mistakes you've seen applicants make during the EB1C application process when they file without an attorney? Um, yeah, it really depends on how much time you have. But let me start with this. We always recommend um, that you work with an attorney to get this uh, file. Um, the first thing to look at would be the qualifying relationship between the two entities, right? The overseas entity from where the person, uh, from where the beneficiary has the qualifying experience and uh, the entity, the petitioner in the US. So there should be a qualifying relationship between the two. Um, either a branch or a subsidiary or an affiliate um, type relationship. And um, you have to specify, you know, you have to be careful to, you know, to really review the corporate documents and make sure you, um, you explain the corporate relationship correctly in the initial filing. Um, sometimes we've had clients who said, oh, you know, it's a, it's a branch or it's a, an affiliate and it actually turned out to be something else, right? So um, you want to get that right. So always examine the corporate documents and um, make sure it is represented correctly in the, in the initial petition. Uh, the second um, thing would be actually make sure that the beneficiary is qualified. So, um, you know, up until a few years ago, we did not even have to provide proof of the managerial role that the person performed. But of late, we are seeing RFEs, requests for evidence from USCIS where they um, they want to see actual evidence or proof that the person performed in a managerial um, or an executive role abroad and is you know, now performing a, a similar or a, a, a managerial role in the U.S. So it's um, good to proactively provide that, uh, that proof in the initial petition. I think you can significantly cut down on the number of RFEs by doing that. And... Um, um, you know, the other thing to keep in uh, mind is that if the person is a people manager and there's only one line of people uh, reporting uh, to him or her, then you have to make sure that they're all professionals as defined um, by CIS. So those are a few things to uh, keep in mind. And we often see RFEs on these uh, points. So it's good to, uh, you know, uh, proactively address them in the initial filing. That's great information, Dia, and all very important points. So if you are thinking about going through this process, make sure you're working with a trusted attorney to go through this process so that you don't miss anything and you definitely hit all the all the markers. So, um, Giliana, can you walk us through the process um, for applying for an EB1C visa? What does the application process look like? Okay, so um, the application process um, even though it's a permanent visa, it does not require the PERM certification, which significantly cuts the time frame right, for processing of this I-140 petition. So the employer files the form I-140 petition for alien worker that um, the petition includes um, the necessary documents are beneficiaries experience letters, his organization charts, information on his report is, uh, and also um, 
as Dia mentioned, it's important to include documentary evidence of managerial duties, right? That uh, could demonstrate uh, that he was performing and will be performing managerial duties and working in a managerial capacity. Uh, also, we include uh, supporting documents as well as the employer's uh, support letter. And also it's important to um, include as part of the application, um, the documents from the employer that would demonstrate um, the employer's continuing ability to pay the offered wage as of the priority date. So the employer uh, can submit the um, evidence of income such as annual report, federal income tax return, audited financial statements, to demonstrate uh, continuing ability to pay. Back to you. That's really great to know. Are there any specific documents that our applicants need to keep in mind that are typically required for the EB1C visa application that you didn't already mention? Specific, so I would uh, say that um, 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 in addition to um, all supporting documents, right? We always recommend for the beneficiary to be ready to submit documentary evidence of his managerial um, responsibilities, right? Such as um, uh, emails, the actual documentary proof, such as emails showing his managerial uh, responsibilities, such as promotion letters, leave approvals or appraisal reports, appraisals he was uh, giving his um, to his subordinates, right? Emails evidencing uh, his responsibilities and high level communications, emails about project, discussions about project and the proposals and plans with the, his uh, name uh, on, on, on them. And also, um, so this is as far as uh, managerial duties, right? Proofs, uh, documentary proof for managerial duties. And also supporting documents that uh, include uh, the beneficiary's passport, I-94, visa approvals, edu his education documents, offer promotion letters from his employer, his W-2 form, and his recent pay stops. Thank you for diving into all of those details for us, Gilyana. Um, Dia, can we discuss family members accompanying an EB1C visa holder to the United States and what are their rights regarding this? Yeah, so they would um, they would get derivative benefits based on the EB1 petition. Um, it's not a work visa, right? It's, it's for the green card, for the permanent residence. So the EB1 petition is only filed for the principal um, and after that is approved, and when the priority date becomes current, at that point, the dependents would either apply for adjustment of status um, with the principal, um, if they are lawfully present in the U.S. at that time, or uh, they would uh, pursue consular processing of their uh, immigrant visas if they happen to be overseas. But that comes in only when the priority date is current, which, um, you know, if you're from certain, if you're born in certain countries, it could be a little later. Um, after the approval of the I-140 petition. That's really good to keep in mind. And regarding the current processing times, Gilyana, what are, what are the processing times look like for the EB-1C visas and what factors typically affect these timelines? So like we all know, the timelines uh, change. Uh, so the current timeline for I-140 petition in the regular processing could take up to nine to... Uh, 11 months. Uh, sometimes it can take up to several months, a little bit less. But uh, right now, um, uh, EB1C category um, has an option to file in premium processing, which is going to take about an average 45 days. But uh, uh, lately, we've been seeing that some I-40 petitions are getting approved as fast as several weeks. So that's the current timelines. Wow, okay, sounds like the the approval rate currently is, is pretty quick. So um, Dia, are there any country specific quotas or delays that applicants should be aware of at this time? 
Um, yes. So um, as with, uh, uh, you know, with other things, there are limits on how many visas, employment uh, based visas can be um, immigrant visas can be issued to nationals from any one, partic uh, one particular uh, country um, during a fiscal year. So because of that, when there is, a, when there is excessive demand from uh, one or more countries, then there are limits. And so then you have retrogression, which basically means that even after your I-140 petition is approved, you still have to wait for your priority date to become current. Um, and it's only after it becomes current that you can file for your adjustment of status which is a final stage in the process or the consular processing if you happen to be outside the US at that time. Um, so for India born nationals, um, you know, at this time, there is a retrogression. It was, uh, EB1 was the best category to be in. Um, it was current for several years, um, you know, with uh, some uh, uh, retrogression in between uh, after 2018, I believe. But, um, you know, the last couple of years, it remained more or less current. But this year, again, it went back uh, pretty far. And now it has gone back to, uh, I believe, 2016. Right, Giliana? Yeah. yeah. So it's gone back. And we are expecting it to, uh, you know, probably remain that way for some time. So if, you, if you're born in India and you have an I-140 approved um, in the EB1C category, still, you know, it's great. But you might still have to wait for a few more years before you can file for the final stage uh, I-485 application. That's so, Giliana, once this visa is granted, what are some important considerations for maintaining your status in the U.S. on an EB-1C visa? So once the I-140 petition is approved, um, the beneficiary can keep extending his um, H-1B visa beyond six-year max out in three-year increments until his priority date becomes current, according to Department of Labor's uh, visa bulletin. So when his priority date becomes current, he can file I-485 application for permanent residency and adjust his status. So if he holds a valid H-1B visa and his spouse has a valid H-4 uh, visa, then the spouse would be eligible for H-4 ED based on the I-140 approval. That's really great to know. So Dia, are there any significant recent policy changes affecting the EB-1C visa program that we need to be aware of? So the good news is that the EB-1 laws have not, well, good or you know, bad, depending on how you look at it, but the laws have not really changed significantly um, in recent years. But at the same time, USCIS has offered certain clarifications on you know, how they interpret uh, uh, the law. Um, one of the helpful um, uh, policy decision, uh, policy um, notes that we had from them is that um, they clarified that when you want to show, when you're trying to establish that the person is um, functioning as a manager or an executive in the U.S., you can take into account, um, you know, uh, the teams or people reporting to him or her from overseas. So you can pretty much take the global organization into account. Um, it's not that you have to be supervising people who are just, you know, in the U.S. You could be supervising um, employees of the organization who are in other um, other entities, jurisdictions worldwide. Um, you could also be, you don't have to necessarily be uh, supervising them. If you're an executive, for example, you can uh, simply take their support. They could be relieving you of administrative um, duties as CIS looks at it. But uh, you know you can take offshore support for that. So that's uh, that's been helpful for companies which have a lot of uh, uh, manpower overseas, but might be um, lean in terms of staffing in the U.S. Right. So uh, that's been a welcome uh, clarification. Um, the other point or other clarification that uh, came out a few years ago was that um, USCIS said that they clarified that you should not have interruption of more than a couple of years, um, you know, from your uh, tenure in the global organization. So as Giliana mentioned earlier, the qualifying basis of the EB1 petition is that you have to demonstrate um, in the three years preceding your entry into the US, right? Um, you know, just uh, uh, to put it um, summarily, that's what it is. Now are people who had gaps. So let's say you came to the US and you're working with ABC, you know, global corporation, but then you took a break, you joined some other employer 
and you worked there for a couple of years and then you decided to go back to ABC um, Corporation again. So how does how is that um, that gap in between or the break in um, employment treated? So they've said that if it is more than two years, um, then uh, you are not eligible for, if the break in employment with the um, organization, global organization is more than two years, um, then you have to go back overseas and serve another one year managerial tenure overseas before you're qualified again. Um, so it is helpful to have that clarity um, and have USCIS explain how exactly they address these gaps. Yeah, thank you for sharing those clarifications and those updates in, in the past years that USCIS has made regarding this process. So, Gilyana, can you discuss how the EB-1C visa leads to permanent residency and what are the steps one needs to take for this? So, um, once the I-140 petition is approved, we need to keep monitoring the monthly visa bulletin from the Department of Labor and uh, look out for the priority date to become current. So once the priority date becomes current, um, the um, beneficiary can file uh, a 45 application to adjust his status. So let's talk about the case of a changing of employment. So what happens if an EV1C visa holder changes jobs or the petition petitioning company undergoes a significant change? What happens in that case? So when um, EV1C visa holder changes employer, he would need to file a new I-140 petition with a new employer. Uh, but he can uh, utilize his earlier priority date from his previous I-140 petition and request to port it in his new I-140 petition. Thanks for sharing that. That's great information. Would you give any advice to managers and executives who are considering applying for this EB-1C visa? I know you've seen many people go through this process. So any words of wisdom? So I think I would recommend um, them to apply for L1A visa if they can, um, because it has similar requirements to EB1C if their applicants are abroad. But if they are in US on H1B visa, I would recommend their petitioning employers to uh, try to file the LCA with a managerial title, such as a project manager or IT project manager to show that the position, the future position is offered to him is also uh, managerial. Also, I could recommend them to keep all documentary proofs ready uh, for submitting the I-140 petition so they could demonstrate at least one year of uh, their managerial experience with a qualifying entity abroad. And finally, um, they can just keep their supporting documents ready for filing the I-140 petition. Wow, that was all really great information. Thank you so much, Dia and Giliana. That is all we have time for today. So that does bring us to the end of our conversation. To stay up to date with us, please subscribe and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. If this video was helpful, please make sure to give it a like, share it, and turn on the notification bell so you can be notified of our next upload. And if you have any questions or suggestions or want to tell us about your next topic that you want to see, please email us anytime at info at chug.com so we can help you out. And make sure you join us back here next week for more pressing topics that truly matter to you and your business. Until next time, stay safe and take care, everyone. And a special thank you to Dia and Giliana for your time and sharing your insights with us.